Welcome to the fourth chapter in the second economic system, chapter four, state-centered economic systems. So we want to recall from chapter two, the diagram he gave us with the four types of state-centered economic systems. There's the failed state, the predatory state, the night watchman state, and the developmental state. So he starts off pointing out that, by definition, a failed state is only found in a developing nation that is lacking a successful economic system. So we can put that one aside, and we can also put aside the night watchman state, because he's previously told us that one does not exist. So really, we're only left with the predatory and developmental states as being relevant if we're trying to figure out what makes a functioning state-centered economic system. So what do these two states have in common? They would both have an exercise of power by a relatively small group of rulers. They would have the ability to put on taxes and collect them <laughs> so that the state can take some of the surplus created by the economy. And the state would have a monopoly on the legitimate use of coercion and violence. Now, these may not all sound rosy, but if you think about it, they're all needed because of what this, what is it that we need a state to do? What are the two fundamental purposes of the state? And one is to protect individuals from each other, right? We got to prevent a runaway self-interested group of individuals from making choices that actually harm others. Um, and the other is to overcome collective action problems. So the state needs the power to uh, collect some of the surplus, for example, maybe to uh, handle the issue of an externality or some other collective action problem. All right, so these three things that were listed here are what the two types of states have in common. So what is different between the two? Well, predatory states are different because they had the economic interest strongly involved in the state, which was a fancy way of saying that there's bribery and corruption. The people in the state who are supposed to be running it for the betterment of all are instead enriching themselves by essentially um, granting favors to some interest groups in return for some sort of financial benefit. Um, in the developmental state, that's not occurring, and the state officials are making the decisions based on the public interest. So that's the big difference between the two. All right, so what all that means then uh, is that developmental states are strong in two ways. It is strong enough to promote economic development and strong enough to resist interest group pressure. Uh, the failed states violate the first one. They can't promote economic development. The predatory states violate that second characteristic. So clearly we would prefer a developmental state. I know I would prefer to live in one rather than a predatory state. What determines how a state develops? And he gives us these five criteria here. Um, how a culture is will affect how a state reacts to stressors. He gives us the example of the Great Depression. Germany turned more towards a strong, very involved government, whereas the US reacted with more regulations, but still not really a stronger centralized government. The strength of your constitution, how difficult it is to change it, that can obviously be something that could hold off the predatory forces. Distribution of power is an interesting one um, because it can be a negative feedback loop. Um, so if you have a nation with greater inequality in the distribution of power, it's more likely to become predatory. And where does that inequality come from? It can come from either wealth or political influence, but once you have that, it sort of supports each other. So the wealth buys the political influence, the political influence attracts wealth, and it can be a very difficult loop to get out of. Quality of leadership is kind of similar. Um, if you have good people in there that are doing things for the public interest, that sort of feeds on itself. But if it gets... Um, if, if a few politicians figure out how to enrich themselves 
and and then maybe they bring in some of their friends and their relatives and the kind of people then who are attracted to be in politics are the ones who see a way to benefit themselves and so it can spiral down and with the quality of democracy he's just mentioning the idea that it, it can matter how involved your citizens are um, how transparent the political processes, how much accountability there is. These are very important aspects to maintain a higher quality democracy and increase the likelihood that you will stay a developmental state. So from here, we're going to start looking at what state-centered economic systems have looked like through history. And we start with the early empires. They were actually preceded by the primitive societies, which will be a community-centered economic system. Um, and then as time went on, some of them settled down, became agricultural societies, began to generate a surplus. And the existence of the surplus often meant that a community was no longer enough to govern. Um, it could cause conflicts between those in the communities. It could cause military conflict between societies as maybe one of them wanted to take the surplus of the other. It could even be quite violent as one state took over another. However, if it was a more well-run state that was taking it over, it might not be all negative. Um, submitting to it might be better because otherwise even more violence. Um, now, a well-run state could take over multiple communities and gain economies of scale, more specialization. If they were, well, if they were a well-run state, they were providing public goods, infrastructure, roads, bridges, that sort of thing. Um, but there are also predatory empires, or you might even have a well-run empire that over time becomes predatory. And so essentially the surplus that was being generated is no longer being used in a productive manner that often could lead to the downfall of the empire, or it might fall to another empire. So Clark dates the end of the empire time to the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476 because that leaves a political vacuum. Uh, it's essentially a return to a community-centered economic system and or chaos. Uh, now in 800 AD, there was the Holy Roman Empire. It was Charlemagne's attempt to bring back the state, but it, it didn't really have the money behind it to actually be a successful state-centered system. So essentially from the year 500 to the year 1200, it is a more community-centered feudalism time period, which we will talk about more in the last chapter, the chapter about the community-centered economic systems. Um, so you do have at the end of the feudalism period, states beginning to develop, say around the 1200-ish time, and the states can uh, start to clash with each other. The most successful states are extract, who are you know, extracting the surplus the best are the ones that compete. By 1600s, the need for military funds is clashing against the rising merchant class. Um, this brings up a topic that we saw in a little history of economics with, I believe Quesne was the name, uh, where there was the challenge where the monarchs couldn't tax aristocracy because that's where they've been getting their loyalty. Um, but you have this rising merchant class who has money and power and essentially you start to have some clashes between the merchants and the aristocracy uh, and they will rise up against the state and put the monarchs in check, which is one of the things we saw will lead to the capitalism. That was one of the prerequisites that was necessary. All right. So anyway, larger point, feudalism, community centered, grows into mercantilism, state centered and is eventually transformed into capitalism, market-centered through the Industrial Revolution. Um, and so he does d discuss some, oops, I should have been showing you this, how mercantilism, is, which is a state-centered system, will actually serve as, the, as, as a necessary step in what will allow capitalism to develop. Um, because without well-developed markets to coordinate economic activity, the state had to manage the economy after the breakdown of the customs and traditions governing feudalism. It was only when markets became sufficiently prevalent and mature that the state could actually relinquish its control. And so essentially what we see Adam Smith's writings um, actually, you know, if you fit them into time, they're essentially, he was observing the ascendancy of the market and he was recognizing the obsolescence of mercantilism.
And so we know that mercantilism will yield to capitalism, which was last chapter, market-centered. Um, and then in reaction to capitalism, we're going to have a couple of systems, fascism and communism. Um, so he gives us, this is kind of where the chapter gets a little murky, starting here. <laughs> he gives us this long list of what these two systems have in common. Uh, they both arise in reaction to the social disruption wrought by capitalism. So this again brings us back to a little history of economics. We saw some of the um, reactions to the negative side of capitalism. We saw the utopian movements, um, and as well as what we're seeing here with fascism, communisms, communism. They're both reacting to the problems of capitalism. Uh, let's see what else he says here. These two have several things in common. They both attempt to mobilize all citizens to work under the direction of the state toward a common goal. They both suppress individualism and self-interest by demanding ideological purity and devotion to the state. So these do have a lot in common, but they do have a fundamental difference. And that is fascism defends private property, whereas communism seeks to abolish it. Um, and then fascism, unfortunately, has a nasty habit of also having a, some ideological horrible principle uh, like racial superiority. We saw that with the Nazis. And then he spends a little bit of time telling us about the historical occurrences of fascism. The reason it's named that is it actually comes out of Italy. And there's an Italian word, I assume you pronounce it fascis, which is how, which is a rod that is actually made up of a whole bunch of smaller um, rods. <laughs> and each one is very weak, but when you bind them together into this thing, they're very strong. And so that's supposed to be the symbolism of fascism. And you can see in that symbolism how that is very much a state-centered idea that, you know, all together we are strong as opposed to maybe the more individual actions of a market-centered system. Um, so then um, after talking about fascism and communism, we need to start also considering socialism. And this is where it really starts to get murky. <laughs> he mentions Karl Marx. Um, well, first of all, he says socialism lacks a clear definition. Uh, Marx says that socialism would be the transition from capitalism to communism. And if you use Marx's definition, we've never had communism, <laughs> even though we would say we had communist Soviet Union, communist North Korea, etc. Um, there are alternative definitions of socialism. Uh, some even define it as a state with an extensive welfare system. But this is, you know, you see this in American politics, uh, this confusion of what is socialism. Um, some are saying, oh, look at Europe. There's these European countries that are socialist and they're working so well. And then you talk to the country and the country's like, we're not socialist. <laughs> we're, you know, I don't know what term they would use, but using the, the terminology from last chapter, the capitalism chapter, they would maybe say we're welfare capitalist, um, where we have an extensive welfare system, but we still have a market centered system at our root. So I'm sorry <laughs> that I'm being so vague, but if you ask me, so is this chapter. So one thing you can do is turn to the diagram, figure 4.1, that he does include in the book. And he's got these four isms here, fascism, capitalism, communism, and socialism. And he's got them on the um, across two spectrums. So one is, uh, do you have private property or is it not very common to have private property? So the two that seem to put higher value on private property are fascism and capitalism. And the ones that are more state owned um, are communism and socialism. And he has socialism a little closer, like there's maybe a little more private property than, social, than communism, but a lot less than fascism and capitalism. And then the other is how reliant um, you are on markets. And so fascism and communism, communism are going to be more state determining what's happening. So they're low on the market, but he has capitalism and socialism as high on the market. So using that figure, socialism would be a system that doesn't really have an uh, extensive amount of private property, but somehow still relies fairly well on markets to make decisions. Whereas fascism, is, excuse me, communism is not relying on the market or private property. And of course, capitalism is in the square where you rely on the market and private property is important.
Um, so the overall point to take from this is that state-centered economic systems in more recent times would be characterized in fascism, communism, and socialism if you can figure out how to define them. <laughs> All right, so from here, we want to move into um, that part of the chapter where you're looking at the strengths and weaknesses of that particular economic system.